The Macabre World Podcast is brought to you by Darker Art Studio, home of real human bone jewelry. Stock and custom pieces are available, so visit us on the web at www.darkerartstudio.com and show them your darker art side. Macabre World, a podcast from Darker Art Studio, where we explore the dark, strange, and unusual from this world and beyond. Hello and welcome to the Macabre World Podcast. I'm your host, Rocky Degatti, and with me today is author, speaker, magician, and Houdini expert, John Cox. John, welcome. Hi, Rocky. Thanks for having me. It's wonderful to have you here. And John is talking to us from sunny, well, at least at some times, uh, Los <laughs> Angeles, California. Not sunny today. It's it's very rainy, but kind of cozy. Uh, well, you know what? That's see, that's 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 a nice spot. I always thought it didn't rain in Southern California. Isn't that what the song says? Well, when it rains, it really rains. Uh, but then when the rain stops, you won't see rain for five, six months. And so when it returns, I'm always happy. There you go. Gets everything growing again. So right. how did you get interested in Houdini? Tell me a little bit about your history with magic and how you got to where you're at. Oh, boy. Well, you know, I first learned of Houdini when I was very young. So young, I'm not even sure how old I was. Uh, and my sister had a little turtle, one of these kind of silver dollar size turtles that you keep in a little uh, uh -huh. tank. And this turtle escaped from that tank, got <laughs> down off the uh, off the um off the tabletop and and got into a closet and it did it three times. And we have no idea how it did it. And my parents said, hey, let's name the turtle Houdini. And I was like, what does that mean? And my dad sat me down and he explained to me in a very dramatic way. <laughs> Boy, I remember this. Sure. He said there was this man who lived long ago who could escape from anything. And they nailed him in boxes and they tried everything and he could escape. And my young mind was just blown. I was really learning of the miraculous for the first time. And it was some guy named Houdini. And this stuck with me. So when I'm 10 years old, the movie Houdini, which is an old biopic starring Tony Curtis and Janet Lee, wonderful oh, yes. movie, it would repeat on television quite a bit. When I'm 10 years old, I see this movie and I decide, wow, I've got to find out more about this guy, Houdini. And I was sort of an oddball kid. I wasn't into the normal things. I wasn't into sports or music. I was into Universal Monsters and Sherlock Holmes and, sure. and stuff that you had to kind of go and seek out uh, through books, magazines. And I thought, I wonder if I could find a book about Houdini. I wonder if I could. I just want to see what he looked like. Even then, I knew movies weren't the truth. Um, and I was very curious. I wonder how much of this is true. Did he really die on stage? And so I began to seek out information on Houdini, and that brought me into this unique world of magic and research, and my journey to discover the truth of Houdini has just never stopped. Now, folks looking for some really cool background information can go to www.wildabouthoudini.com, which is your website. And one of the things I think is so awesome is the newspaper clipping of you as a teen. Yeah. Tell folks a little bit about a little bit about that experience. Well, I, what was it? Was I fifteen? Um, you know, I got very into Houdini, and I also started performing magic and and doing some escapes. And I guess maybe I was inspired by Houdini, the great self promoter. And I wrote to the newspaper saying, "Hey, I'm a fifteen year old Houdini nut. Wild <laughs> about Harry is what I was what I said." And uh, I'm very interested. You should come and interview me. And they did. That's and I got this little line up in the paper. <laughs> Teen is wild about Harry. And then I took that little clipping and I sent it to a larger paper. And they came out and interviewed me. So I had this little this little uh, brush with fame. When I, I think was I need you to be my publicist. <laughs> <laughs> But that's fantastic. I mean, so many of us, you know, have passions that come and go, especially when we're younger. And then there are some things that stick with you. There, there are fascinations. Like, obviously, for me, it's for anything, you know, unusual and mysterious. 
I've I've always been drawn to that. And it seems like, you know, once you kind of got the bug, once you get bit, it it it, it does stick with you. So you started and I, I have to ask, what was the first magic trick you learned? Uh, the first met, well, first of all, you, 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 you flattered me by calling me a magician. Uh, I'm not a magician. I can't do magic to save my life. I'm too self-conscious. Uh, so I performed magic as a kid, but then I decided to retire at the wise old age of 16 and just study Houdini. So, uh, okay. Well. But, but let me, but that's a nice question. I went to magic stores seeking out information on Houdini, books, magazines, anything. And of course they want to you know, the guy behind the counter just wants to sell you magic tricks. And I remember getting this cool little trick. He said, well, if you're into Houdini, you should, you should look at this trick. And it's a little trick where it's a, it's a little card and it has a picture of Houdini in chains and you close the wallet and you open it and Houdini is gone and the chains are, are just there. And so I said, yeah, that's, that's Houdini enough for me. I'll take that. Let's call that my first magic trick. <laughs> I always tried to learn card tricks, but I forget the backstory. So, you know, I always liked the backstories. I, I did. I did shows and I, I liked the backstories. I liked the patter that you got uh, along with things. And I was usually pretty good with, with, with the story and the performance, but it, it was just too scary to stand up in front of people and, and try to try to deceive them. I was always afraid I would I would blow the trick and you know you're just you're just you're just so close to humiliation. It, it backstories are tough, man, because there's the <laughs> one with the jacks and I don't remember what the first one goes to the village to do some I don't know, but in the end you get the jacks and I don't I don't even remember how I got there. It was just <laughs> crazy. But, you know, I've I've always been fascinated because growing up, I grew up in the 70s. Um, I was born in the late 60s, so I grew up in, in the 70s. And I remember the, the the magic that I saw on TV was mainly in variety shows because mm -hmm. that was the thing. And one of the things I wish they would bring back is the variety show. They were a blast. Yeah. You know, and everybody had one. Oh, my gosh. There were so many. So, you know, we, we had all these variety shows. And I remember seeing uh, magicians like young David Copperfield when he was coming on a TV in the 70s. Yeah. Um, I was particularly enamored of Doug Henning. I was well, an amazing, amazing, amazing magician. Uh, you know, I also was raised, uh, born in the 60s, raised in the 70s. Okay. And, you know, when I saw the movie Houdini, it was in November 1975. And in December 1975 is when Doug Henning did his live special on um, amazing, MC, I think. And when he escaped from the water torture cell. So, yeah, magic came roaring into, into my life. In fact, the whole world seemed to kind of turn for me once I discovered Houdini, because 1976 is the 50th anniversary of Houdini's death. And suddenly all these old books are being reprinted and new books are coming out. And Doug Henning has now cracked open this new golden age of magic. Right. And so, yeah, the whole world seemed to kind of suddenly be all about magic and Houdini. Well, it's is it fair to say? I mean, there's there's now you know there's there's many uh, famous uh, magic acts uh, that have gotten into great renown, but that there is a little bit of Harry in a lot of these famous like I've I've seen Penn and Teller live, mm -hmm. who who outwardly speak of their admiration of Houdini and will and have yeah. done many similar tricks and and is you know really is is that the main influence? Is he the is he kind of the grandfather of all of this? I, I wouldn't say that for performing magicians. You know, it, it depends on what kind of uh, 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 magic you do. You know, for sleight of hand people, um, you know, uh, Di Vernon is certainly, you know, the greatest magician that ever lived to them. Uh, but Houdini is a presence and he and he dominates magic today just as he did back then uh, as far as the imagination of the public and a lot of the great magicians, David Copperfield, um, you know, pay homage to Houdini and were inspired by Houdini. David Blaine talks about how oh, yeah. he was gripped by just a photo of Houdini on a cover of the book is what made him suddenly see magic as this fascinating art form. So Houdini certainly plays a part in 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 the in the formation of, of just about all magicians. Well, you know, if folks look uh, looking up um, uh, file footage, like some people I think listening may not have heard or, you know, don't know a lot about Harry Houdini, if you look at what he looked like, he had this really, really intense look. Yeah. Very intense. And and of course, me very mesmerizing about the eyes, which I suppose is the the hallmark of a great performer. But you know, something I always I always thought was interesting was um he he had pretty humble beginnings, did he not? 
Uh, very humble. He was um, an immigrant. He came for, with his family from Hungary, settled in Appleton, Wisconsin. And um, his dad was a rabbi. And when they came to America, they were fine. You know, Appleton was a very, and still is, a very beautiful small town, very progressive town. Um, his father was 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 putting together the first synagogue there. But he lost his job and the family fell into poverty and never really climbed out. And so that was something that always drove uh, Houdini was to, you know, escape poverty, take care of his family, um, you know, become become uh, become a champion. And he did. Oh, yeah. And he did. <laughs> And, and we're talking uh, more or less like the a little just after the turn of the century is is when we're going into his the height of his career. Are we not? Or uh, help me with the timeline. Uh, he was born in 1874, came to uh, America in 78, and he begins to practice magic in 1891. That's when, you know, he had he had a job in New York as a tie cutter uh, in the garment uh, district. This as is in neckties. Neckties. Um, and this is sometimes in biopics, you see this portrayed as sort of a sweatshop and, and and him being brutalized. It wasn't true. It was a good job. He belonged to a union. They had dances. Um, I think had he remained in the business, he would have been the king of the garment district uh, when, he, when he was an adult. But he fell in love with magic. He, he read a book called The Unmasking of Robert Houdin. Uh, Robert Houdin was the most famous name in magic at that time. And so he took the name Houdin, added an I to it. And became Houdini and set off on his own career. Uh, and this is this is the early 1890s. And and at that time, uh, vaudeville was was still a thing. You know, I mean, it, the people did go out to the theater. They went and saw live performance because that's all they had. Yeah, vaudeville was in its beginnings. It's really interesting that Houdini's career really goes along with vaudeville. And I don't know if your listeners understand what vaudeville was, but it was variety entertainment that was uh, that was um, presented in large theaters in the big cities. It was family entertainment, and that was very important because entertainment was sort of sketchy. The idea that you could go, women could go, children can go, and it was going to be clean and wholesome, that was part of the innovation of vaudeville, is that we're going to pre present family entertainment. Vaudeville, you know, is growing, but in Houdini's early days, he was performing in dime museums and medicine shows and circuses. He aspired to vaudeville. Oh, um, wow. Uh, and uh, and then and then that is how he got his break. He was finally discovered by a, a manager, Martin Beck, who was looking to book acts on the growing Orpheum vaudeville circuit. And Houdini's act was a museum act, um, challenge handcuffs, stuff like that, a dime museum act. And and Beck saw, you know, if you, we can kind of clean you up and and put you on the vaude, the respectable vaudeville stage, and this act might 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 do something. And he was certainly right about that. So he began in these traveling shows and 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 on these circuits. And what was what would really describe the height of his career? You know, it's um it's hard to tell because he never had a rise and fall. He seemed to just kind of keep going up and up and up. But it was certainly he 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 became successful in 1899 and then really became a phenomenon in Europe in 1900. You know, that was his golden age as the handcuff king. That's when he exploded into the public uh, consciousness. And that was certainly a height. Un unlike a lot of vaudevillians who basically did the same act their entire career, though, he evolved his career, his, his act constantly. He went from being the handcuff king to the self-liberator. Now it was about challenge escapes, nailed and packing grates. And then he became a death defier when he started doing his own inventions, the milk can, the water torture cell. So with each evolution, it seemed to bring a new level of recognition and fame. And then, you know, by the end of the career, he introduces the idea of exposing fraudulent spirit mediums. And that gives him a whole new level of fame. I would probably put his height, you know, in those first 10 years of his career, when he kind of broke, you know, sort of the early Beatles or the early Madonna days, but his career, he remained, you know, uh, a, a very, very popular. And he's a household name today. Oh, yeah. And, and remains it, a household it, name today. This is hundreds of years later. Yeah, it's yeah. it's it really is amazing for, for as far as people at the turn of the century. Very few 
are still so real well remembered today. Very much so. And and again, you know, it, reminding I, I hate I hate ta- sounding like my mother. I'm reminding the young people that this was, you know, this was fame and and recognition at a time when mass media didn't really exist, except for the newspapers. And and I, it, I don't even think the radio was really pulling in until a little bit later. So this was this the source of recognition and renown was through newspaper ads and traveling shows and 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 going in and live theater and live performance well houdini certainly i mean he the mass media of the time was newspapers and newspapers were a big deal you know there were more than you know they were there were three editions a day or two editions and a morning edition even and houdini really understood kind of that newspapers were the pulse of the city and he has this great quote he once said i'm not an advertiser i'm news so he would create news by doing escapes um, and he would get himself on the front page of the newspaper, not back in, in the advertisements. And he understood reporters. He understood newspaper circulation. And so he pl- that was hit the social media of the day. That's how you drew people into the theater. And then he kept going when early movies, he dabbled in early movies and he did start doing radio in, in the 1920s. So if there was a way to promote yourself to advertise uh, for free, <laughs> he found it. <laughs> mastered it and used it to his advantage well you know it's it's a great study in self-promotion but like i said there's a whole lot that was going on at that time and one of the things and you touched on it and i'm i'm, I'm looking for more info here too is at the time was very popular was the growing spiritualist movement mm-hmm. everybody's friday night had table tilting and rapping and 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 mediumship it was all very 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 hot Everybody was into it. There were societies. Um, I have a couple of books that were produced by the Occult Society of New York around the turn of the century. And those are those are curiosities for me anyway. But, you know, that this was a very um, active, growing and kind of pan-social movement because it wasn't it was actually mostly the upper crust, but it filtered down. It got to be kind of a thing. So you had like the more folksy uh, folk magic kind of people. And then you had the spiritualist movement and somewhere in the middle, everybody met. So in the middle of all of this is this mysterious man. Tell me a little bit about how Harry and the spiritualist movement went along. Oh boy. It, it's <laughs> a much bigger story than I think most people realize. Um, because it, it, he became interested in spiritualism um, or at least the practice of spiritualism at the same time as magic. Um, and he read books on spiritualist methods and trickery because that was also a viable way to make a to make a living. And a lot of these tricks were sort of cutting edge magic. He also, though, did believe it was possible. And he says this. He says, "I was a believer in spiritualism, and I was so so on one hand, he's always sort of looking for the real thing. It fascinates him. But also, he knew that, this was also an act um, that you could do well with, and the tricks fascinated him. So we, he was always on these two paths to try and find the real thing, but also to learn the methods. And, you know, a lot of his act evolved out of spiritualism. The idea of being tied up, a, spirit, a, a, a medium would be tied up, put in a cabinet, and then ghosts would manifest, and the cabinet would be opened, and the medium would still be tied up. Well, that medium was escaping from those those bonds. The medium was, a, was an escape artist. And Houdini looked at that and he says, you know, what if we took spiritualism out of it? That's an act. Tie me up and I'll escape. Maybe that's something that that will, will interest people, especially if you get a little bet. You know, I bet I can escape faster than, right. than it, you know, within the time that took you to tie me up. And he brings spiritualist methods into his act. He did his escapes in a little cabinet and he called that cabinet his ghost house, which is a nod to spiritualists. And you can bet spiritualists at the time said, well, this sensation Houdini says it's all a trick, but we know he's a medium. So it followed him his entire career. And and he, you know, he was, like you said, he was not a, a full on skeptic. He wanted to believe, but did he ever, did he ever uh, exclaim that he had any kind of proof? Or, or anything like what was, is that he ever become a believer? I guess that's what I'm asking. He never became a, a, a believer. Um, 
he he studied it. He bought books. He went to medium or, he, you know, he kind of followed the practices of mediums. Um, and in the 1920s, when spiritualism has this big resurgence after World War One, he connects with Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the creator of Sherlock Holmes. And Doyle is a big believer in spiritualism. Very much so. Yeah. And uh, wrote several books about it. And Houdini and him struck up a friendship. And Houdini thought, you know, all I've ever seen in my life is, is trickery. I would love you to introduce me to the real thing. And Doyle said, absolutely, I'll hook you up with the best people in London. And Houdini went to these mediums and they're 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 worse than, than anything. He's just he he can still see that they are using tricks. And so throughout the and so it becomes sort of a conversation, an open conversation in newspapers about Houdini's belief in 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 spiritualism and Houdini says you know I would I would like nothing more than to uh than to be convinced but I've just not been convinced and here's a reward for any medium that can convince me and then it started to turn into a bit of a a, a challenge act and Houdini really began to take offense that mediums fraudulent spirit mediums were taking advantage of 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 people that were grieving Certainly. lost loved ones and um and he felt that he he had a mission and his mission was to expose these fake uh these fake mediums and um and protect people and uh and and he he got into it <laughs> well i mean there's there's a lot of uh i mean i i know we spoke briefly uh before we got on air about the um, the magic castle in in Los Angeles, California, and for folks who are unfamiliar, and I I don't I didn't know very much about it myself. I passed by it um, on a trip, and it was it looks fascinating if you, if you're just driving by, and the magic castle is a private uh, magi magicians club. Yes, the magic castle here in Hollywood, uh, the Academy of Magical Arts. It's a it's a private club for for magicians, but it is with an invitation from a member. It's also a wonderful nightclub. They have a great restaurant. They have uh, several different performance spaces that you can see shows. It's a very, very popular place. It's 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 inside of this beautiful old uh, mansion, authentic old mansion, and um, it's just a very special and, and unique uh, unique place here in Los Angeles. So it, if you're ever in LA, let me know and I'll I'll hook you oh, up. Oh, I was waiting for that. <laughs> 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 You're going to regret that. Absolutely. Well, one of their most um, uh, popular shows is the Houdini Seance. They they do a Houdini Seance. Yeah. Tell and me. I mean, I don't castle. know what you can tell me about that, but I mean, is it is it a seance or is it is it a a seance themed act? Well, being the Magic Castle, you're guaranteed results. So it, it's 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 <laughs> okay. a. Uh, yeah, you you know you go in that seance room and stuff's gonna happen. They're gonna make sure the the mediums are very very talented uh, magicians, and um, and it's a it's a whole it's a whole show. But it, speaking of seances and Houdini, um, if I'm not mistaken, I want to say it was ten years after he died. Now his he, he and his wife had like an arrangement where he said, you know, if there's a way to do this, I'm gonna do this, and they had a code and all that kind of stuff. And in 1936, they had a seance on the 10th anniversary. Did they have one every year after he died? Tell me a little bit about his immediately posthumous uh, seance history. Yeah, well, Houdini made a compact with his wife. He made a compact with, with several friends. Um, you know, near the end of his life, he was very much involved with, with exposing fraudulent spirit mediums. But, you know... He always believed, you know, that that if it's possible, I should be able to to do it. And so but he wanted to protect his wife because he said, when I die, everyone's going to come to you and say, hey, right. we've got a message from your husband. So he said, let's just, you know, he, you turn the burden of proof back onto the medium. So let's come up with a code. And if I am coming back from the dead, I will only communicate to you using this code. So when someone comes to you and says, I have a message from 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 Harry, you just say, what is What's the code? And Bess did hold seances, not public seances. It's a little unclear if these were regular, regular things, but she would she would occasionally have a seance. I'm sure she did something very private on the anniversary of his death for those those 10 years. Uh, but in 1936, they had the big public 
final Houdini seance on the roof of the Hollywood Knickerbocker Hotel. It was a legitimate seance uh, to give Houdini one last chance. And um, he didn't come back. And she said, 10 years is long enough to wait for any man. And she she said, uh, that's it. He's He's made his point. He's not coming back to me or to anyone. Good night, Harry. Good night, Harry. Yeah, exactly. But that didn't stop magicians who to this day still do a, a seance every Halloween. Just but that sounds like that sounds like a great event to attend, especially if you're if you love magic and you love the history of magic and, and all of that. And speaking of the history of magic and, and Harry Houdini and how much you love, tell us about your book. Ah, well, I'm very excited. Uh, later this year, uh, my first book is going to be released and it's something very, very unique. Um what it is, is that there's a collector, Dr. Bruce Averbook, and he owns Houdini's first travel diary. Now, this is from Houdini's early years, um, when he was a struggling magician, including the time that he worked as a spirit medium, uh, or at least did spiritualistic entertainments. And Bruce has owned this, this, this diary for, uh, for a few decades, and he's always said, I want to share this um, with researchers and with the world, but I want to do it in the right way. And so that right way was to get together with a great publisher, Mike Caveney. He is an author and a magician and also a publisher of very beautiful high-end specialty magic books. And he said, why don't you publish, let's publish the diary. Let's publish every page of this diary so people can look at it and read Houdini's words himself. And Mike said, that's a great idea, but his handwriting is hard to read, and I'm not <laughs> sure what, what most of this stuff means. So let's have John Cox go through this and flesh it all out. Give us context. Give us annotations, which is what I did. We then went to some of the top collectors, including David Copperfield, who's been incredibly generous for material related to these early years, photographs and what have you, and combined it all into a book that's being designed by a very talented guy named Michael Albright, who does a lot of stuff for the Magic Castle. And it's going to be a, a beautiful book that tells uh, the story of these early years of Houdini, I think, um, unlike any other book. So I'm, I'm really excited. I think it's going to be something very cool and special. It sounds amazing. And folks need to get on your website, www.wildabouthoudini.com and follow the progress of this because that's going to be that's going to be up and coming. So, yes, they, they need to they need to get in there and follow. So I know it's probably like asking somebody to name their favorite kid. But uh, what do you think Houdini's greatest trick was? That's got to be hard. <laughs> it it is hard. Well, hers. It is hard if I answer it personally, but but I think history has has proven or shown us that his greatest trick was his Chinese water torture cell. It's what he called it. And that's the trick in which his feet are locked in stocks. He's turned upside down and he's submerged into a tank of water with a glass front so you can see him. It's locked up and he escapes. That just seems to encompass everything. You know, the claustrophobia of being locked in a space an underwater escape with 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 with, with There's time. no air, no air, and the glass front. What what a what a genius uh, thing! So audiences yes. can actually see him in there. It just really encompasses all the drama and terror of 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 that kind of escape. And you know, he introduced that in 1912, and that became his feature escape for the for the rest of his career. People never got tired of seeing him do the water torture cell. So I, th I think that that was that was his greatest escape. And, and, you know, and magicians, as we spoke of Doug Henning um, and other magicians have either done the same trick or elements of a similar trick it, as an homage to that original trick. And that's and I think all of us, when we think of Houdini, if we're not thinking of chains and straight jackets, we're thinking of that water tank because we've seen yeah. it or we've heard about it and all that kind of stuff. Um, how did he die? Well, he uh, it was a series of unfortunate incidents that happened in October of 1926. Essentially, he was um, on tour and he was in Montreal. He had given a lecture at McGill University and invited a student backstage. And um, that student's name was 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 was, was Sam Smilovich. And from Smiley, we know what happened next. And while he was backstage with Houdini, another student 
shows up, a guy named Jay Gordon Whitehead. And he was a little bit of an oddball. First of all, he was I, I, he was like 30 years old, which was unusual for for a student. Um, and according to, um, to, to Smiley, he sort of peppered Houdini with questions, seemed to kind of dominate. And eventually he asked Houdini, is it, I hear that you can take a punch to the stomach and withstand that blow. And Houdini said, yep, that's true. Houdini had broken his ankle earlier in the, in the tour. And so he was laying down on his cot. What happened next isn't clear. Either Houdini was in the process of standing up or he simply didn't want to stand up because he had a broken ankle. So he just remained on, on the cot with his back against the wall. But Smiley took his, his saying yes as an invitation. And, not Smiley, sorry. Whitehead took his yes as an invitation, came in, started punching him hard in the stomach several times. <laughs> well, it hurt like heck and the pain didn't stop. But Houdini kind of said, well, you know, it hurts because I got punched in the stomach and he didn't say anything about it. The tour moved on to Detroit and that's when the pain got so bad. He finally did consult a doctor who advised he go to the hospital, but you know, the show was sold out and Houdini went on stage anyways. He did his show with a 104 degree temperature. And yeah. as it turned out, a Sexist. ruptured appendix. Um, he was operated on, but, uh, Back then, if your appendix rupture, um, it was pretty much a death sentence. But he held on. He held on for a week until he finally gave up the fight on Valde's Halloween. How 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 interesting! I I mean, you know that that that's the day. Yeah, yeah. He he made an exit. It, he really did. He really did. Talk about a great I always, escape. <laughs> I always wonder if he knew. You know. It was a terrible final week. He had a, a raging figure all except for one day, I think. Uh, so he was not in great shape. I wonder if he was aware it was Halloween. <laughs> he probably wasn't. He probably had had lost all track of all track of time. But I didn't realize that it I mean, I don't know if it was either sepsis or peritonitis or you know, whatever the 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 complications, but from the rupture of the appendix, but that's that's very dramatic. I I didn't I didn't actually I I often wondered if he died doing a trick. I didn't I didn't think he had, but I wasn't sure. So I well, didn't that, realize that's how that's how he went out. That 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 Tony Curtis movie that I loved so much as a kid. It shows him dying in his water torture cell, or at least becoming trapped in his water torture cell at the end. Um, so a lot of people believe that that's how that's how he died because of the movie. Uh, but um, nope. Uh, he died in a hospital. Oh my goodness. So you do lectures. Talk, uh, talk about some of the things that you speak on and the type of, of events that you do. Cause this sounds like something that a lot of libraries, uh, colleges, a lot of places would, would really uh, benefit from having one of your presentations. I do do lectures. Um, and I do them at, at, at you know, libraries and schools or Wherever they'll have me, uh, I can do a talk on Houdini's life. I can do spiritualism specific. I like to do a talk about his movie career because a lot of people don't know that he, that he that he made movies. Lately, though, I've been kind of doing talks at magic conventions, and I love to to do real specialized ones. You know, I went to a collector's convention um, last year in Cleveland, and so I said I'm going to kind of drill down and just tell you about Houdini in Cleveland. And it turns out there's a lot to say about Houdini in Cleveland. In 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 May, there is a magic convention on the Queen Mary. Oh, wow. In Long Beach. And so I said, you know what? How about a talk about Houdini on ocean liners and the things he got up to? So I, 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 I really love building talks specifically to whatever event or whatever place uh, place it is. It's fun. So again, folks can go to your website, www.wildabouthoudini.com, and you can find out where John Cox is going to be speaking. You can find out more information as the book unveils itself. Yes. And you can see some very, very cool uh, blog posts. I, I love the blog. I really enjoy it. And um, very cool blog, you know, so be, you can learn as you go in in, in digestible amounts because it's a lot of information. You have an incredible amount of information. I mean, I know this reeks of hubris, but it's OK. This is where you say these things. Are you the foremost authority on Houdini? <laughs> 
Well, I would never or in that about, circle of <laughs> I, I'm in that circle. Let's say I, I I feel like I'm in that circle. I will say that I think it's safe to say I devote more time to it than anyone else. And that's just because other people have a life. I'm not burdened with a life. <laughs> I can devote all my time to, to Houdini. So I think I probably at this time and place uh, spend more time studying Houdini than, than just about anyone. Oh, that's wonderful. Though. That's what a great, what a great way to, to, to just embrace your passion. Um, Does he have a legacy family? He does. He does. Um, now he never had children himself, so there's no direct right. family, but um, his, his brothers did. And uh, there is family on his wife's side, and they're they're great folks. Um, George Hardeen is 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 uh, is um oh boy, it's uh, Houdini's brother Hardeen. Hardeen with his grandfather, so nephew, grand nephew. I'm not sure how how it goes. He's a terrific guy on Bessie's side. Um, there's family, so yeah, he's he's got some family, and and I know them. And uh, that and must have been all... exciting to meet them. Very exciting. When I first met George. Um, it was at a, it was at a convention and I was sitting in, 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 down in the, in the hotel, uh, um, little breakfast and I saw him come in and I could tell even before he turned around, I'm like, that's Houdini. He has, he has the body. He has kind of the whole look. I thought, oh, I can see it in and out. I can see Houdini in him. And he's a, he's a great guy. He's a lot of fun. Oh, that's terrific. Do you, do you have any, uh, are there any current uh, magicians that you're particularly a fan of, of that are current, you know, that are currently working? Well, I, you know, I have my favorite magicians. Um, I love Penn and Teller. Uh, oh, I do course, too. David, I love David that. Copperfield is, is, is the king and, uh, and you know, it is, it is, it is wonderful to see him, see him perform. And um, David Blaine, I like uh, quite a bit, although I've never seen his his live show, but I'm told you really need to see that. You, you know, to see that, you really kind of understand what Houdini, what Houdini, seeing Houdini must have been like. And there's and there's a lot, I think, uh, now with the advent of uh, YouTube and, and the availability for just anyone to be able to make a video or a podcast. I mean, let's, you know, <laughs> here we go. So, you yeah. know, that kind of thing. I think there's a lot of up and coming um inspired magicians oh for sure for sure i you know i'm not uh i'm not too on top of that but um but there definitely is it's it's we're still in this golden age it was kicked off by 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 doug henning and we seem to just be constantly renewing uh great magicians um it's a it's it's a good time i will tell you all the youtube in the world is not going to teach me that stupid trick with the three jacks i can't do it I can't do it. I'm just, I'm just terrible at it. And, uh, you know, it's, but it's, it's amazing. Like I said, the influence of Houdini is, is huge and his, his mark on, on show business in, in history and, and, you know, the, the things he, he was probably one of the first, I guess, informed skeptics of the spiritualist movement. There's, there's a whole lot going on there. So I'm very, very excited uh, for your book to come out and learn a little bit more. And again, folks can go to www.wildabouthoudini.com and you can learn a whole lot and enjoy yourself doing it. John, thank you so much for coming and visiting us. Any, uh, any words of wisdom? Any quotes from Harry? Oh, boy, I should have one ready, but I'm afraid <laughs> I don't. Uh, my brain is the key that sets me free was something that he uh, that he liked to say. So remember, your brain is the key that sets you free. And that's great advice for all of us. Thank you all for listening. And remember, stay kooky out there. Thank you for listening to Macabre World. You can find us on the web at www. Dot darkerartstudio.com